Well, I am super excited to be here this morning, and um, I grew up in the Unitarian Church. I don't know if you know the Unitarian Church. It's kind of the cafeteria plan. Um, loving people, smart people. My mom still attends that church. Uh, but God has had me on a journey from growing up within the Unitarian Church, where it, it is very open, believe what you want to believe, to coming to Christ in my late 20s, uh, to then kind of, I guess I would say I've, uh, I've moved from uh, very liberal to conservative, not wacky conservative, don't get me wrong, I'm from Indiana, um, uh, oh, that is conservative, sorry, um, but anyway, this journey that God has had me on has been uh, j- just a blast for me, and I don't know what your story is, but I think our stories are so important to what God has us doing. Uh, And for me, I can look back on my corporate work and having been the the elusive unchurched that we all chase after, that that we are called to reach, um, I think that was perfect preparation for the work that God has me doing now. And so I really celebrate that, that journey that I've been on. The work that we do at Fishhook, and I just say this to kind of put in context, Um, what we're going to talk about today. The work that we do has to do with coming alongside churches and partnering with their staff, partnering with their lay people, and taking the most advantage of the communication horsepower that they already have and helping them in the areas of branding and identity, um, communication coaching and consulting, uh, and web and e-strategies, and then an occasional odd project that doesn't fit those categories. Um, It's this communication, coaching, and consulting that really has led to the topic that I'm going to talk about today, which is the seven deadly sins of church communication. In these assessments, we're able to come in at the church's request, a church saying, help us. We know that we're not communicating as clearly as we could. We know we have problems. We know we have struggles. So come in and help us. Kind of like, you know, a few years ago, I realized, wow, I'm into my 40s now, and I'm putting on the weight, and I'm not feeling that good, and, you know, and I made a decision to go to the doctor. And um, in going to the doctor, then some things were revealed to me that, about my health that could be better. So um, in these communication assessments, we're able to kind of peek behind the veil within a church, see how God is at work, and see the, the function and dysfunction of communications. That's the kind of the context from which I talk today. Uh, let's take a look at this sign here. You can just write your own joke, can't you? Um, this is in a small town in Morris, Illinois. If you go to Chicago and you start driving to where, like, the suburbs start to change to farmland, and then you keep driving another half hour into the corn, um, you come to Morris, Illinois. And, um, and I just love, I love a lot about this sign. And I've even had, I've shown this to some groups, and they're saying, I'm not sure if the arrows are pointing right. I think maybe the Presbyterians and the Methodists are a little more left. The Baptists are a little more right. Anyway, you can write your own joke. But here's the thing. Here's what we've discovered. No matter the denomination, the size of the church, the size of the town they're in, the makeup of the people on the staff, churches struggle with the same basic communication issues. And we've discovered there's about seven of them. Similarly to like if I were to go to the doctor, or any of us, kind of depending on our age, but for the most part, if we walked into the doctor and they did a physical, what are they likely to say? You ought to eat better. You ought to get more sleep. You ought to get more exercise. You ought to watch your cholesterol. And then to me, they might say, you might want to have that mole looked at. And then to you, they might want to say, you know, something else, some unique thing. But for the most part, our health issues are similar. Our church communication health issues are similar. Looking here um, at our next slide, this is really important about today. Because this, this image speaks to my heart of how I come to you today. Um, 
I just feel like we cross-pollinate. God's given us the opportunity to cross-pollinate what churches are doing well. It's not like seven years ago I had figured out everything about church communication. I knew zero, nothing. I knew about communication, but I didn't know how it played out in the church other than just how what I saw as a, you know, an active member of my own congregation. So over the last seven years, it's not that my team and I were so smart. It's just God's given us the opportunity to peek inside a lot of churches. And so I just feel like I'm one of these bees, and you're another one of these bees. And here we are on the flower. Shouldn't we be at Flower Mound? Isn't that close by, the suburb? Um, and so we're going to come today, and I'm bringing stuff that I've learned elsewhere, and hopefully sharing some of that with you today, because it's not what I know, it's what we've learned, really. That, and that's true for, I believe, all of us. So the seven deadly sins, now, I don't know if you remember them, I don't know, where, I don't know, your growing, you know how you grew up, and they were lust, I don't know if we, anybody grew up in Catholic school, you might be able to just name these in your sleep, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. And okay, maybe it's a little bit dramatic to, to, to connect these to church communications. And I know that theologically they're a train wreck. Like I just want to say that they're a train wreck. Theologically they're bad on almost like the, but, and also I, I want to like, I'm not making light of sin. Like sin is sin. And I can go down that list, I got them all. Okay, every one of them. You know, like it used to be I ate too much. So that was gluttony. And then that would turn into sloth because I just wanted to hang out on the sofa. And then my kid would want me to play. One of my kids would want me to play, and that would just make me mad because I'm trying to rest because I really it was too heavy. And then I lost some weight. I got pride going now. So we, I, we got them all. Um, but here's an interesting thing. Okay, so if you're going to do uh, some light research on the seven deadly sins, where would you go on the Internet? Wikipedia, right? The source for all shallow research. Um, when you need a quick fact for a sermon or something really quick, here's the interesting thing. The concept of the seven deadly sins is that these were like capital, like they were bigger because they led to other sins. They opened the door to other things. I mean, King David's lust turned into other sins. And so I'm not endorsing the the notion of the seven deadly sins, but similarly, it's interesting, as, as we unpack this morning these challenges that churches face as they, as they try to communicate, I think we're going to be able to see, and you'll be able to see in your own church, that these seven issues open the door to a host of other problems. So in that way, they are a little similar. And I would call the first half of this talk kind of the misery loves company talk. Oh, yeah, preach it, brother. We got that in my church. And then the second half, we're going to look at six recommendations. What typically do we point churches toward in terms of how they can find improvement? And there, hopefully, you'll celebrate, oh, yeah, we got three of those done already. Or, ooh, we got a long way to go. Or maybe it's just, oh, good, now I can name it. So when I talk with my pastor or my leaders, I can put a name to this thing that we've been struggling with. And I would like you to just kind of keep a note of the seven as we go along, if you struggle with them. Because you know we're to bring our sin into the light, right? So uh, I I just want you to to keep note of of these seven and just keep a little tally. And and maybe we'll have a little game. See at the end, is anybody suffering from them all? Testify, brother, testify. All right, are you ready to see the, the first sin? The first big one? The sin of ambiguity. The sin of ambiguity, it's blurry or boring vision. We see this show up in churches, what I would call them as the we try everything church or we don't do anything church. And in our case, because we're usually working with churches that are like they're striving hard to grow, they're trying things, they're working, they're trying to create momentum a lot of this times this plays out, and you may see this in your own congregation, blurry vision leads to we do everything. We say no to nothing. 
I'm, we'll do interviews like focus groups with church members, and they'll talk about the busyness and all the stuff, and the staff member will talk about it. And inevitably, somebody will use the phrase, yeah, it's like around here there's always the flavor of the month. And, and again, just like one of my natural gifts is like the gift of encouragement. So this is really hard because I'm, I'm not beating up. I don't want to be viewed as like beating up on the church because these are all churches saying, help us do better, Right? But, you know, like, even in my own congregation a few years ago, like, I can remember in one, like, six-week period, it seemed like the start of a Hispanic service was the biggest thing we'd ever done. And it got, it, you know, like, they just promoted it like crazy. And then, like, two weeks later, the orange children's ministry concept was promoted like crazy. And then, like, within two weeks later, this crystal clear mission project where we were going to do a a local, state, national, and international mission project. That was our thing. Like, so, in, like, in a six-week period, we had these three big things, and then there came up this last-minute opportunity to do Habitat for Humanity, so that got thrown in a week later, right? And so, we hear people in congregations, and you may feel this, there's just so much going on. And I believe that's tied partially to blurry or boring vision. Or... We'll interview congregations, and we'll say, you know, Pastor, what's your church about? Well, we're a Great Commission church. Great. How does that play out in your vision? Well, that's how it plays out. Well, I believe that like, God has created each congregation as unique as he has created each of us. And so people want to rally together. Throughout the Bible, God called groups of people to rally together to do big things, and to me, that's about vision and strategy, to be able to take a hill, to be able to do something. And so a lot of times how this plays out in a church is what I call the no-mo church, no momentum. It just feels like without vision, you don't have momentum. You're not, you're busy, 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 busy. It's activity, but there's not a building, there's not a momentum. And we were doing this assessment project with a about a four or five hundred person church in a suburb of Atlanta, and they're surrounded by these mega churches. And they were, they were trying as a four or five hundred church to do all the things that a four thousand church, person church is able to do. And the pastor, as he was starting to grasp this issue, said, "Wow! So I guess in terms of communication, if we try to be all things to all people, then we end up having to communicate everything to everybody." It's the sin of ambiguity. And some of you are nodding your heads. So I, I feel that some of you sense this. Or you just have that natural gift for encouraging the speaker, where you'll nod at anything I say. Who wants a cheeseburger? Yeah, go, brother, go. I love you people, by the way. Keep nodding. All right, you ready for number two? Number two, the sin of paradox. Paradox is ineffective leader communication. So doesn't this feel good? So far, we're really beating up on the pastor. By the, any pastors in the room? Sorry if we are. Yep, thank you. And I don't mean we're beating up, but this is, this is something that they struggle with. And, and, and pastors will say, we told our people about blank, and they were surprised that we were going to do blank, and then they were so surprised when we actually did it like they weren't listening. And the reason I call this, I mean, I, churches are a, like a flowing stream of change, aren't they? It's one change after another. It's staff changes and facility changes and ministry changes and kind of depending on your structure, um, you know, elder-led, pastor-led, congregational-led, depending on that, you need more or less kind of voting buy-in, but you also need people to emotionally understand and buy in and be part of these changes, right? If we're going to switch from a Sunday school model, adult Bible fellowship model, to a small groups model, like the congregation may not need to vote on that, but we need them to understand it and buy in. And, and so the reason I call it the sin of paradox is because it seems like the more emphatically the leader says, we told our people 
the more likely it is they told them once in one way. And those leaders who say, like, we told them and we told them and we told them and we built it up and we told them this way and we told them that way and we told them this way, but we're still kind of worried they won't get it. That's the healthy. That's healthy. So it's the paradox because the leader who says, you know, we had a congregational meeting one Sunday night. It snowed in February. And we told them, like a third of the people showed up, mostly the angry ones, right? But we told them. And this isn't just pastor to congregation. Let's make this clear. This is pastor to elder, pastor to staff, staff to staff, staff to people, We cannot communicate effectively enough as leaders to the audiences around us. And here's here's what's really important. Here's why I think this happens is because, and let's just take, um, let's take a facility change, something big. Those church leaders, the building committee, pastors, the ministry leaders, they have been working heads down around tables like this for months or years on that project. They've been to zoning committee meetings. They've walked around property with real estate agents. They've had architects out. They've looked at color swatches. They've done all this stuff. They've even talked at home. Like they, and they have all this time to process and embrace and understand. And so there's two culprits to an ineffective rollout of something new. It's time and familiarity. The leaders have worked so long and are so familiar, and the congregation typically hears about it for a very short amount of time, and they're very unfamiliar. And so I encourage you to talk with your church leaders to say, never forget that our congregation is weeks, months, or years behind where we are in the understanding of this change. Never forget the gap. Small groups, the discipleship team has been meeting on this for a year. We can't roll this out just in two weeks and expect people to embrace it, own it, love it, change their lives like we have. Sin number three, the sin of uncertainty. And, And you are probably the answer to this already in your church. But the sin of uncertainty is decentralized process and people. Decentralized communication process and people. In about my second year into this, um, I got a call from, and we had not done this assessment stuff before, I got a call from an executive pastor of about a 3,500-person church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Fort Wayne's Indiana's second largest city, about a quarter of a million people. He says, uh, Evan, We're a 3,500-person congregation. We have a daycare, so we have a staff full part-timers of about 80 to 90 people. We're in a city of a quarter of a million people, and we have no one in charge of communication. And we have no formal communication processes. Wow. And so I went and met with them, and and I looked at their 16-page bulletin. Right? Um sat in on their worship service, listened, did focus groups, asked questions. And I remember the worship pastor said, Evan, it's like this. It's like, and they had like eight pastors around the table. It's like all of us, we're all competing for the attention of our people, the congregation. Like we're competitors in the same environment. And it's like we're all trying to jump through this funnel to get to our people. And I said, Pastor, for you guys, that's a lofty goal. Because really the way it was working is like they each had, to use a different analogy, they each had their own fire hose. And intermittently, every ministry would just turn that fire hose on the people whenever they had something to promote. There was no centralized function. And so I'm guessing this is kind of a preach into the choir. This is one of the reasons why you're here. But just because you have centralized people doesn't mean you have processes that work. Or just, so we're going to explore that a little bit more. Um, and this one for sure is an issue that opens the door to a multitude of other problems. Number four, 
The sin of bewilderment. Bewilderment. And for, for certain, and bewilderment is disorganized messaging. For certain, uncertainty and bewilderment go hand in hand. And just look at the word bewilderment. Wild! Be wild and wonder what we meant. And like, if we're going to use sin language, bulletin is to bewilderment as Jack Daniels is to alcohol and drinking. Drunkenness, the sin of drunkenness. Or bad haircut, somebody's new bad haircut is to gossip. Right? Um, you know, we just, we explore and we, we see churches organize their messaging around all kind of crazy strategies, if you want to call it a strategy, a happenstance. Um, churches that organize, whether it's the web, whether it's the three announcements they make or the five announcements they make on the platform that week or their print material, it's organized by first in, first on. Whoever calls in first, whoever gets it to Betty or Tom or whoever is that, they just take it. They put it in. You get it, put it in. So we'll see. I mean, you may have seen organized that way. Or when it happens, it's like the bulletin or the website. It's just one big long calendar. And the problem is, if the church has a vision or a strategy, the messaging probably ought to be built some other way than these two happenstances. And so that's just not helpful for people as they try to take a next step. As the people in our congregations try to seek out what is the next step or what are they interested in, if, if a bulletin or, a, or your worship folder is not organized in a way that helps them discover that next step, like if it's just chronological, church in Cincinnati, large Presbyterian church in Cincinnati we worked with, literally the bulletin, the worship folder, starts with 1 o'clock on Sunday. That's when the youth meet. And then everything else for the next several pages is organized by when it happens. Which is really helpful if what you're trying to do is say, I got free time on Wednesday night. I wonder what's going on on Wednesday night. But that's not how people seek things. Something for men, something for kids. So again, I'm probably preaching to the choir. You wouldn't be here. But this plays out in really damaging ways when people can't take their next step. The sin of bewilderment. Number five, the sin of separation. Separation. The failure to meet generational needs. Show of hands, how many of you struggle with print versus E? Print versus web. Okay. I remember, friends, a day in 2005... When every church made the decision, we're going to kill our newsletter and we're going to the web. Because what? We're going to save money. And those that didn't do it then, in 2009, they made the decision to do away with our print and move to web because it's green. Those are both Worthy reasons to make a change, but they focus on the wrong thing. They don't focus on audience. And part of the challenge is that when the churches made that change, they didn't resource the thing they were counting on getting done, the, carrying the water. They didn't resource the web. They didn't necessarily get the right, you know, additional training or change things culturally or get the... so. Here's what we hear. When we do an assessment, what we hear are things like this. Well, we tried this, but. We tried doing away with this, but. We tried going to that, but. Nobody in our church will use the blank. We're afraid that we're going to make blank mad. So this is one you've struggled with, and hopefully we'll see some thoughts or answers. That's number five, the sin of separation. Number six, the sin of contradiction, bad branding. 
The sin of contradiction. And I would say that, you know, we look at branding for a congregation as it, if it's bad, there's a lack of clear and compelling identity that matches the church's DNA. Who the church is and who the church says they are or presents themselves to the community are not the same. And it's more than just the logo. It's more than just the tagline. It's the sum total. Branding is the sum total of all the things that a church says and communicates, whether it means to or not. Um, let me tell you a little story. There's a, a town of about 50,000 people. There's one big employer. It's got manufacturing. It's got an, and an international headquarters. So you got like blue collar, white collar. 50 years ago, a church started. And when this church started, it was kind of um, a little separatist, kind of an us-them. Not an us-them like us and them, but us and them, right? Um, and they named their church, and they grew. And in the last 10 years, kind of the second and third generation of leaders within this church, um, they've really changed that. They have a huge heart for reaching people in their community. And, and this is... Um, Maybe it's six, seven hundred person congregation. They don't have a director of communications, but they are desperately wanting to communicate better. And so they, their, their church leaders go to conferences. They've studied North Point. And they don't just go and say, oh, they do that, we'll do that. But they, you know, they're learning, they're working. And so they've built up these awesome ministries. And so when we would interview the people in the church, we heard this several times. And the story goes like this Hey, tell me how you invite a friend to your church. Oh, it, this is great. Like, and you talk to some church member, and they're like, okay. And this was like three, four years ago before the real estate market went crazy. He's like, I just watch in my neighborhood for, for sale signs. And then I watch for the sold sign. And then I watch for the moving van. And when the moving van comes, I can't wait to go and talk to my new neighbors. My wife makes a plate of cookies, and, um, and I take them a, a Lowe's gift card. Like 10 bucks. Hey, welcome to the neighborhood. And he said, what I try to do is I, you know, if it's not that day, it's pretty soon. Like I'm trying to get that conversation to going, hey, are you looking for a church in town? And if they say yes, then I have this opportunity to talk about my church. And I tell them about my, oh, we have this awesome children's program and the kids love it. And then the youth, my kids can't, like the kids can't wait to go. And the music's great. And it's like a surprise every week. There's something new and different and it's awesome. And the new neighbor says, oh, what's the name of your church? It's an awesome church. And really what you ought to do is, why don't I just come by on Sunday and you could follow me? What's the name of the church? Uh, Berean Bible Church. Now, this is not a church that's wanting to diss the Bereans who were faithful. And they're not ashamed of the gospel. But in terms of, they feel like, they felt like it was a barrier. Time and time again we would hear, it's just kind of, it's kind of the letdown in the invitation and again, that's, I'm not saying this is the case for every church. There are Berean Bible churches that maybe ought to stay Berean Bible churches. But this was one where there was such a discomfort and tension. And I, we also see, in terms of bad branding, we see churches take their vision words, like what they want to be about strategically, and they put them out to the community. Like reach, teach, and share. Or, in the tagline, ex exalting or proclaiming. Show of hands, testify. So, so we go back, I don't have church, oh, it's just Berean Bible Church because uh, this is a young, hip, energetic congregation. And at least in the area where this group was, they felt like Berean Bible Church sounded stuffy, conservative, separate. Like, does that make sense? Does that help? Help make that connection? But we see churches put these... It, again, assuming they're trying to really reach out, we see churches put these challenging words for the unchurched. And I would just say, exalt, don't tell them you're going to exalt. Proclaim, don't tell them you're going to proclaim. Reach, don't tell the people you're going to reach. I mean, tell them internally, this is what we're about. But that's not your invitation to the community. And to help make this illustration, think about um, Outback Steakhouse. I'm going to start the sentence, you finish it. Ready? 
No rules, just right. That's their invitation to the community to come and have dinner. I assure you in the kitchen there are rules. And at the corporate headquarters there are rules. So they probably have some internal slogan that's like meeting every customer's needs, creating a great customer experience. So we just see churches putting, we think, words that create a barrier. All right, and then sin number seven, and this is the only one that I picked from the original list, it's the sin of gluttony, over-communicating. The church is a smorgasbord of choices with lots of things to do, to taste and to see. And so we see churches that just, if it's happening, it's published. And it's all published at the same volume, the same amount of space. It's just too much. Racks of hundreds of trifolds and paper and web, everything is on the home page. You know, I guess it's analogous to, like uh, a couple years ago, I had a, my son was in grade school, my daughter was in middle school, and my oldest daughter was in high school. So on a monthly basis, we got like 140 pages of PTO newsletters, right? You know that stack in the kitchen that stacks up? And in the church, we do the same thing to people. We just see it. We, we believe that church leaders' appetites to tell people stuff exceeds the people's appetite to listen. It's gluttony. But friends, there is a path to righteousness. We believe there are six paths to righteousness where you can have victory over these seven sins. So hopefully this becomes the encouragement part. Let's go to the six. Um, yep. Number one, foundational, centralized communication function. Show of hands, how many of you would say you represent that? You are that. Okay. We believe this is absolutely the foundational number one priority for a church in getting a path to victory over these issues. And we believe and we see the most successful ones. It's not like we dreamed up the list and then we, we've just seen, boy, here's what seems to work. Highly relational communication director or department or coordinator, whatever you call the title in your church, but they're highly relational. And these are the qualities that we see in the successful ones that are, that are making the most difference. They're a coach. They're a problem solver. They are a leader, and they understand leadership stuff. They can talk leadership with the other leaders. They're a planner. They're a communicator like they have verbal and written skills. And they're a shepherd. Because whether with a staff or a lay team or a combination, they cannot go it alone. They don't go it alone. We see the successful churches, those who are communicating most effectively, kind of following this strategy formula. The church vision and mission drive the church's strategy. That drives ministry priorities, and that drives a communication strategy. There's a link. You can, you can follow a message. You can look at a communication message that's delivered on a week, and you can follow a rabbit trail back to the mission and vision, the big messages. And I believe that every communication director, coordinator, whatever that central person absolutely must have at least a listening seat at the leadership table. Better to have an advising seat, but if you're trying to get your way to the table, ask for a listening seat. Because, as one church communication director told us, who the meeting she sat in on was not the big boy meeting. She was having the meeting where they were also discussing which toilet paper to use or what the copier or office policy was going to be about some 
this person needs to be at the senior leadership table because the, the model of investigative reporter is a horrible way to have to work as a communication director. And I think I'll probably go to my grave fighting for that one. Um, and then this relational person proactively works alongside and serves the ministries. They lovingly help ministries get the right amount of messaging based on that ministry's connection to the overall strategy of the church. And they, they get the strategy because they're sitting at the table where the strategy is being talked about. And then they lead a team to passionately release the leader's message, the leadership's message. Pathway to righteousness number two, tiered communication. And some of you are probably doing this effectively. Some of you may struggle with it. And sometimes some of you just may need a, again, this is the kind of thing, this is a word you can start using with your staff and you can start building a conversation. Tiered communication says there are A, B, and C level messages within the church based on the strategy of the church. There are not A, B, and C level ministries but A, B, and C level messaging. And this brings structure. The easiest example to look at would be on the web. If it's a web, if it's a homepage with everything on it, everybody says, can I get this on the homepage? Can I get this on the homepage? Well, you know, ideally your website has a main area with two or three main messages. That's your A level. Scroll down a little bit below the fold. You've got maybe three choices. Those are B-level. Go down farther or dig within the site, and you're going to find your C-level. An example, um, if Easter outreach and invite a friend is a huge event, and strategically that's one of the things that your church is about, that's an A-level. Your model train ministry is probably not strategically an A-level. Oh, you snicker, but I know someone in the room, and their church has a model train ministry, and there's also the knit, crochet, and pray ministry. We love these people. We love how that is like a small group for these people. But if there's 10 members, they're not an A-level ministry, an A-level message. We want the model train guy to be passionate. So it's a, it's a balance. Unless your church leaders have said, you know what, we're going to reach this nation by being the most outstanding model train ministry church anywhere. Because we've done research, and did you know that there are a million people a year who buy model trains? And I mean, you could, that could be a strategy, and if that's the case, brother, it's A-level. But tiered communication gives you a vocabulary, and then the centralized person has these conversations where they say, you know, the women's retreat is going to be an A-level message for a period of about three weeks, but we're six months out from it. So, for about three weeks, we're going to make it a B-level message because we want people to save the date. And then I just need to let you know you're going to become a C-level message. And then we're going to promote it again about three months out because registration will begin. And you'll become an A-level message. And then you're going to have to go back to a B. And then right beforehand or afterwards, because afterwards we're going to celebrate what happened, we'll make it an A again. So, tiered communication gives you that vocabulary, and you can have, you can invite, like if somebody, you know, you're going to, sometimes you'll do this, because we want those passionate leaders. You have the conversation over a cup of coffee. Help me understand, like share with me, like put the pieces together. Help me understand how you feel it's an A-level all the time. And then you have this conversation. Okay, pathway number three, pathway to righteousness rally around the church's compelling vision. This assumes that step one has taken place already, and that is that your church has a compelling vision. And that's another session for another day. But through a journey of discovery and prayer and retreats and God speaking and your leaders listening, I would hope that your churches have a compelling vision. Your role is to help articulate that and it comes together with, I believe, a vision metaphor. It's not enough. Lynn Sweet, 
I heard Lynn Sweet, Leonard Sweet, uh, author, biblical historian, futurist guy. Um, he said, it's not enough in this culture that we have a vision statement, like 25 words that we can put on the website or the wall. We have to have a metaphor. We have to give people a brand, an internal brand, a mark, a tagline, a phrase, something we can preach over and over again. When Jen Long, our host, stood up here from the church, and she said, I, I only caught the first... Uh, we're a people, we're a church here uh, that gives our lives to Jesus to bring others to. Like, I don't know if you heard that. I bet that is crystal clear around this place. So, create a brand for the vision and a communication plan that slowly over time, remember that whole heads down thing about the change and the vision and what are we about? That slowly over time gives people an ongoing stream of information and inspiration about your vision. And we share with pastors, vision must be the meat of many of your sermons and the seasoning of almost all of them. If you're in a church like I have been, we've seen a change, where we had a rousing vision Sunday sermon on the second week of June, that is not enough vision. Pathway to righteousness, number four, strengthen your brand identity. Strengthen the brand identity. And again, that's a process. That's a whole other session. But through a process of discovery and design and planning, launch to your people and then launch to your community a brand. And it may not be changing your brand. Maybe it's just refreshing how you get the brand out to your people and to your community and we just see this as a huge momentum builder within a congregation. When a congregation can say afresh, hello, I'm. And the people can put on new sportswear. And they can have a new stainless steel coffee mug and a soccer chair. And it creates the opportunity for conversation with friends and neighbors. And just as natural as like, I'm a Colts fan. Can I say that here? So, something that's consistent and clear and memorable in a very crowded culture. And I would say, we encourage church leaders to keep this in mind when it comes to their branding. It's a very crowded culture, and your brand needs to compare favorably with all the other brands that the people in your community see throughout the day. And in my old work in the corporate world, we made this analogy. We did some work with local car dealers. They were going to have their car ads, right? but they were gonna show them during football games. So, you're gonna have a United Airlines, do you remember when United Airlines had that da 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 and there'd be these images that would bring like a tear to your eye, right? And then there'd be like a Budweiser commercial that would just kill you, make you laugh. And that car dealer was gonna stick his ad right in between the two of those. And if he was gonna be perceived as quality, his ad at least had to compare favorably. So look at, consider your church brand as you drive for lunch and see all the other brands that we're exposed to. Does your compare favorably? Does, is, it, is it attractive in the culture? And we're not to be of the culture, but we're in it. This is where we're placed. Okay, number five, bridge generational communications. Excuse me. Bridge generational communications. Why the water? Why the image of the water? Communicating with the different generations is like this. Your print people. And it's not just, it's, age doesn't always define whether someone's print or, like I'm 46, so I'm a digital immigrant. I didn't grow up with it but I've forced myself to immigrate to digital land. Okay? My mother-in-law is 77. She's on her third laptop. So it's not always just about age, but it's about a mindset. And you can't take print wholesale away from people if they are wired for print. And you can't capture e-people with print. So... I believe if you're going to overcome the sin of separation, 
you do it by continuing strong strategies for both. Because information is like water. Print people, they are very satisfied on Sunday morning for you to hand them a glass of water. Your bulletin, worship folder, whatever you call it. And they are going to drink information out of this while they wait for the service. And then they're going to put it in their Bible. And they're going to take it home with them, this one glass of water. And they're going to set it on the counter. And if they want to know something during the week, they're going to go back to this glass of water. Unless they're the people who set it by the door like you're going to recycle this, right? Okay. E people, we want a magic drinking fountain. We want to carry it in our pocket or have it in our backpack. And we don't want to be burdened with carrying this around. And we don't want the information you put in this. We want our own information. And at four in the morning, if I wake up and realized, oh, crud, I didn't register my daughter for the youth retreat and the deadline was yesterday. I have to be able to go and get a drink of information, just the information I want, just the form I want, at just the time I want. And so, if you're in a situation where you are not resourcing both of those strategies, you're leaving people out. And I don't know if there will come a day where we can get away with one. I'm guessing that just about the time it does make sense to do away with print, there'll be some other thing we'll have to adopt. The chip in our head. I don't know what it'll be. My mom's 77. She goes to the Unitarian Church. She wants a computer. You know why? Because she feels guilty that the church secretary has to photocopy and mail her a print copy. Your print people may want to change, but you may need to help them. I'm my mom's digital Sherpa. We went to the Apple store. We're looking at the iPad. You know, find out, can you create something in your... If you want to make that move, help people make it. Okay, Number six, our final one, path to righteousness. Move from giving information to communicating messages that evoke a response. Get over our gluttony. I truly believe that the more information you give people, the less likely it is they'll read any of it. You ever go to a web page that's just got so much on it you don't even look? Like, oh, that's overwhelming. Gone. Somebody will hand me a book, say, oh, you've got to read this, this church strategy book. This is really good. At least the way I'm wired, I opened up, ooh, too many pages, too little type. <laughs> right? The best book I ever saw, the title was so good, I didn't even feel like I need the book. Right? So think in that mindset. Less information means they'll actually get more of it. So just take some food off the buffet and connect it to your strategy and your tiered messaging. Tell more stories. Celebrate more. Look back. Promote what's next by looking back at the way God has worked before. Tell stories, evoke a response. It's better to tell one good story that helps 50 people take a next step than give everybody everything and every ministry leader is going, I don't know why I can't get people's attention. I'm here over the next couple days. Um, In this setting, I don't necessarily want to do Q&A. And for time, don't want to do it. But I encourage you to just grab my sleeve. If there's a question you have, you want to follow up on something. And we're going to, in the basics track, we're going to kind of wrestle with some of these foundational issues as well. Here's, here's what I want to share with you. The leaders in your church are probably really good-hearted people. And they want to improve. That's what we see. We see people like I was, out of shape, aging, seeing my mortality. We see church leaders saying, we're out of shape, 
and we're not sure what the future looks like. They want to do better. And you may be one of those people who's in the role, but you're not at the table. Lead. Be a leader. Don't ask for permission to lead. Take what you learn here over the next two days and take everything else that you're learning in your life and lead. I'd rather have you get your hand smacked for trying to lead than feel like your environment won't allow you, even if you've had it smacked before. Lead. And have that conversation that, that there are better ways. You can lead your church out of these seven deadly sins uh, as you seek a path to, to righteousness. And my prayer is that if we were to get together another year or two, because it's a process from now, you'd be able to say, I got a seat at the table. I had some hard conversations. We were able to celebrate some ABC level stuff. There was a ministry who actually listened and we did it and we were able to look at a staff and go, it worked. So lead. Be comfortable in the shoes even if the people around you are not. Blessings.